Yo, what's up guys? We're back for another breakdown and predictions video. Today I'm going to be doing Bellator Belfast, Bellator 302, I believe. I'm going to do a full card breakdown and predictions video for this card. Already got a few bets for this card on Patreon.com slash Guru. We're coming off another great week last week where we did make some money. So looking to keep that momentum going. We're on a pretty good run so far this year. We're making money for our patrons over there. And if you're interested, go to Patreon.com slash Guru. You get access to all my bets you get access to many more predictions on many different fights videos breakdowns things like that so definitely appreciate everyone that goes over there supports the channel and you're making yourself some money i'm over 260 tracked um units on bet and tips i am one of the top 20 betters in the in the world that's tracked over there so definitely giving you guys good information definitely should check it out but let's get into this fight card um, just make sure to hit the like button, subscribe down below if you're not subscribed, and um, put a comment if you agree with my predictions or not. But first fight of the night, Nate Kelly versus Jordan Elliott. Nate Kelly, amateur fighter. He's fighting out of SBG Ireland. He's a striker. He won junior titles in kickboxing. Only 19 years old and had his first MMA fight one year ago, so he should be getting better every time we see him. In his fight with Thomas Cowell, he uses striking and his ability to pull counter, he won pretty cleanly. And his striking style should be effective versus Jordan Elliott. He throws uh, good body kicks, head kicks. He can counter off the back foot. Kelly is one of these guys who can dart in, dart out really quickly. So hard to fight. In his loss to Buffon Hall, he got taken down early, gave his back trying to get up and got submitted quick. And I assume Jordan Elliott's game plan is to try to throw big punches, find the chin of a guy who holds his hands low. And then if he can't do that, wrestle heavy. And Nate Kelly in his last fight showed better takedown defense, better grappling defense, even had a couple body locks himself. He attacked with front chokes in the first round, he used a Kimura to reverse position, get on top. He got to the back, he was close to rearing a good choke, and in the second round he hit an anaconda choke. So it seems like he's working on his grappling. He fought on a big stage his last fight for PFL Europe and was able to perform under the lights, so that will help with this fight. And it's the biggest spot of his opponent, Jordan Elliott's fight career. So Kelly should be better in terms of dealing with the moment. And his opponent, Jordan Elliott, from what I saw, he's aggressive. Comes forward with some pretty good punch combinations. You can throw kicks, nice crosses. You'll mix in some uppercuts. He throws low kicks, round kicks, front kicks to the body. He'll blend in level changes um, in between his striking combos. And he does a good job coming in with a... Punch combo up top and then dropping down for the single. And from that single leg entry, he's usually looking to push fighters to the cage and then get the takedown from there. And one thing Elliot needs to get better at is hiding his head when he shoots. I do think guillotines could be successful versus him potentially. And it doesn't seem like he's the greatest in top position. He doesn't look to pass much, mainly just throws ground and pound from his opponent's full guard. In terms of defense, from what I saw, Elliot's. High volume offense is pretty much his defense. He doesn't move his head. He definitely is hittable. Um, I don't think he looked bad in his fight in 2021 versus Paul Stoika. It's just a little hard to gauge because that's the only, only amateur fight Stoika ever had. Um, and Elliott's last three fights were all losses. He lost to a couple of amateur fighters who had bad records. So that's not inspiring much confidence. The last time we actually saw him win a fight was in 2021, so been over two years. And I was able to find his most recent fight. Um, in that fight, he lost a decision. I would say he looked decent, though. Head movement was better. He was able to slip the jab and land some decent combinations. His leg kicks were effective. And he was getting hit sometimes when he went first and tried to close the distance and ended up getting hurt to the body a couple times. Um... He showed heart to survive, but I feel like Nate Kelly is a better fighter here, and I expect a pretty clean win. At 125, it's hard to expect finishes, um, especially with three-minute rounds, but Kelly can probably hurt Jordan Elliott with his kicks, though, and if he does that, there's a possi possibility you can get Elliott out of there. So I'm going to say he wins via TKO here and go with Nate Kelly. And moving on to the next fight of the night, we got Luke Trainer taking on Grant Neal. And Luke Trainer, he's a fighter who's been grooming, uh, who's been groomed for most of his career in Bellator. Um, he debuted at three and zero in Bellator, and he's gone four and one in five fights with the promotion. 
He actually got a big win his last fight over Sullivan Cowley, who's another big time prospect. Getting a step up here, he's taking on Grant Neal, who's a ranked guy at 185 and 205, I believe. But trainer, um, he has a ton of potential just due to his natural gifts. He's very athletic and smooth for someone with this size. Has an 81 inch reach. And he's dangerous on the feet due to his length, his speed, and his power. He's aggressive. He comes forward with the jab, some straight punches, kicks. He throws some dangerous head kicks. Good check hook, too. He usually uses the striking to get the body locked, though. And defensively, he's not good. His chin isn't great. He got rocked multiple occasions against Simon Biong. But Trainer definitely is a good grappler. He's effective on the ground. Uses the striking to get the clinch. He has good body locks. And... On top, he's nasty. He transitions to the back mount really quickly. Most of his ground upon finishes have come when he flattens fighters out after taking the back, and all four of his submission wins are rear naked chokes. And his defensive wrestling is questionable. He got taken down multiple times by Simone Biong. He got taken down by Sullivan Cowley. But in his fight with uh, Biong that he lost, he gassed out super hard. If that happens in this fight, I think Grand Neal... Probably will finish him on the ground. Trainer has to have better cardio here. But he did show a lot of heart in that fight. He survived a deeper and it could choke. He survived a lot of hard ground and pounds. And his last fight, he fought another American wrestler like Grant Neal in Sullivan Cowley. And Sullivan Cowley got several takedowns, mat returns. He was controlling wrestling. But Trainer used the cage to get up actually hit a body lock himself and almost immediately took the back and finished the fight. So Grant Neal has to avoid giving the back mount up at all costs. And if I'm Luke Trainer, I would have spent almost the entirety of my camp just trying to sharpen the jab up. And if he has a sharp jab in this fight and defend the takedowns, should dominate. And if he lets uh, Neal get inside or throws lazy shots, though, that's where he can get countered and he'll have issues. And obviously... The main thing that uh, Luke Trainer would want to do is get Grant Neal's back and finish the fight from there. But Grant Neal, just like Luke Trainer, has had the majority of his career with Bellator. He had one fight before signing with Bellator in 2019 and has got 8-1 and one in 9 fights with them. 8 of those fights were at 205. He went down to 185 for his last fight. He got the win, but moving back up to 205 here. And he's been fighting tougher opponents in comparison to Trainer. But even for Neil, Luke Trainer is not an easy look just because of his natural gifts. And Grant Neil is built the complete opposite for the weight class. He's a spark plug, short compact guy. He's going to have a 7-inch height and reach disadvantage. And he's used to being the small guy at 205, though. He's done well against tall opponents. He's a wrestler. On the feet, he has punching power and a decent jab, but uncomfortable standing up. What Neil likes to do is move around, use a lot of lateral footwork, and then come in with big power jabs, left hooks, overhands, um, faint the level change, come over the top. Isn't a big kicker, but he has huge legs. And when he throws leg kicks or body kicks, they are heavy. If you pressure Neil back with technical striking, he is going to shoot. So overall, he isn't a great striker. And I feel like this fight, Neil has a punching power edge. And if he connects, trainers, chain is a little suspect. But Neil has never really shown power like that. I do think the striking is fairly close. Uh, Neil has stood for a lot of his last two fights, so it was good preparation if he needs to stand up here. And Grant needs to try to use his leg kicks, overhands, clench up against the fence. And when the fight gets a little later, maybe then he could try to strike more at Ranger Trainer. But Grant Neal's loss came when he fought Alex Pelosi. And Alex Pelosi is a good wrestler. He was able to take over on Grant Neal in the second and third round. Pelosi is much bigger, and he was able to control Grant Neal up against a cage for much of those rounds and Grant Neal showed good scrambling ability he was hard to take down but eventually he did give up some takedowns he got held down um but Grant Neal had success in that fight himself and he showed that he can do well against that style which is kind of a similar look to this fight but I think a higher level wrestler with not as good a stand-up but I don't think personally Neal is going to be as easy to submit as Sullivan Cowley after I saw that fight, just because it seems like he has a little bit more submission awareness. But Grant New, I think, should have a cardio edge here. He trains at Elevation in Colorado, and I've seen him go three rounds at a good pace. Um, after getting dominated in round two on the ground, New had at least some cardio to come back well in round three, 
and make the fight a split decision. Um, so I think in the stand-up, Grignot could maybe land and hurt Trainer, and he is a better wrestling Trainer could maybe catch him early on, but I don't think he's going to maintain power for long, and I doubt his defense and striking overall is what he's going to be able to use to win here. Neil should mix in takedowns, try to control, and the only spot that Neil doesn't want to be is on his back. If Neil can be on top, he'll probably be effective on the feet. If he gets all the way on the outside, then counter when Trainer comes in, he should be able to compete that way. And as long as he doesn't get out of position, he should be able to defend the takedowns. Carl Brexton, who's a Great Greco wrestler didn't even attempt takedowns on Grant because it's just hard to do it. And Grant should be stronger and no trainer is going to be looking for trips in the body lock. So he's going to have prep for that. One thing about Neil that I really haven't seen is killer instinct or big power. So that's why I probably think this fight's going to go over. And I'm going to say Grant Neil wins via decision. And up next here we got Abraham Babley taking on Isaiah Pinson and our and Abraham Babley is an undefeated heavyweight fighting out of England. He's making his return to competition after a year away from the cage. And his last fight was in February of last year. Um, fought on a PFL Challenger show. Hopefully Babley can be more active in 2024 because he's only fought once per year since going pro. Coming off two wins in a row over undefeated guys. And he's going to take out a third on Friday. And he should feel at home. He's going to have the crowd on his side. Um, UK guy. Whereas Isaiah Pinson is coming across the pond to fight for the first time from the USA. But Abraham Babley is a fun fighter to watch. He's a smaller heavyweight, but he has dynamic movement. His wrestling is good. He's entertaining. On the feet, he stays light. He's very fast. Darts in, darts out. Mainly throws single shots. He likes to throw counter crosses, come in with leg kicks. He has fast hands. He's pretty accurate. He doesn't commit. Um heavily to his shots nor does he have big power and he does run a lot he is not active but really his game is just using his speed to avoid the fight a little bit getting fighters to overcommit so he can wrestle and he hasn't been hit very much in fights that i've seen he's good at controlling and wrestling up against the fence and i expect him to have the edge here there versus pinson pinson or uh babley has good single legs good body locks he's athletic he scrambles well um and I think Babley probably will struggle to hold Pinson down, but Babley has the conditioning to keep up the wrestling for three rounds. And his style is tough because he has the movement to make you chase him. And when you do, he takes you down. He has the cardio to do that uh, for 15 minutes as well. Isaiah Pinson, he's a fighter who made a name for himself last year through the PFL Challenger Series. He was brought in originally as a fighter to lose to a big Brazilian who had a flashy style and he was a sizable underdog in that fight, but he won via decision and followed that up with another victory on the PFL Challenger Series show, another PFL Ch Challenger Series show later in the year. So he had two big wins last year. And Pinson, Muay Thai fighter, mainly uses his hands. He walks fighters down, uh, bobs and weaves his way into boxing range and throws body head punches. Good job using the jab to start his combinations and then he strings uh, hook, hooks in combination. He doesn't have much punching power, but he's high volume. Um, his leg kicks, body kicks do look powerful. He defensively uses a high guard, and he blocks a lot of the headshots. And Pinson could take a shot, too. He ate some big punches, just walk through them in a couple fights that I saw. Tough, composed guy who likes to fight when he gets hit, or even when he was taken down his last fight, he had a big smile on his face. But he's yet to... Show his grappling, really. As far as wrestling goes, he has an okay sprawl, but takedown defense didn't look the best. He got taken out pretty easily his last fight, and he's good at getting back up to his feet. Um, he does give his back, but he's athletic. He's good at not letting fighters get both their hooks in, and he can explode up. Um, good conditioning, especially for heavyweights, so can back fighters up on the feet, and when they get tired, he can still keep on the gas. And But Babley's going to look... Timlin is usual game plan here. He needs to be evasive, avoid getting in a boxing range, and then wrestle. And I think he'll be a lot faster. He is not going to be the better striker, so wrestling is imperative. I think leg kicks could be effective. For Isaiah Pinson, he has to walk down Babley, cut the cage off, and I think go to the body with his punches. Babley is difficult to hit to the head, but I've never really seen someone try to attack his body. And he has to defend the wrestling and make it a stand-up fight. If Pinson could do that, it should be... A close fight in his fight to lose but I think Babley 
should differentiate himself in this fight with control. I think he'll be able to use his style to take a decision. I think the overs in this fight are going to likely be a good bet if they come in at a good price. And I don't see a ton of finishing upside from either guy, really. Both don't have a lot of power. Even in Babley's last fight, when he took down his opponent and landed a lot of unanswered ground and pound, his opponent didn't really seem that dazed or finished when the fight was called off. And if Babley can get into a dominant position where Pinson is stuck, he could finish. Or if Pinson can get Babley really tired by stuffing his shots, maybe he could finish. But I think most likely it's going to look like Babley's fight with Lou, uh, Louis Sutherland, where he won via decision there. So I'm going with Babley, and I think he's going to win uh, over three rounds. And up next, we got Nathan Kelly. He's taking on Vikas Ruhil. And Nathan Kelly is one of the best new breed fighters coming out of SBG Ireland. He started his career 0-2, but he's won nine fights in a row. 1-0 in Bellator, 4-0 in the PFL. Seven of his nine fights that he's won have been first-round finishes, so been dominant for the most part. And he's 26 years old, so he still is not even in his prime. He should keep getting better. And tall, long, lanky, aggressive fighter. He likes to walk guys down until he can get to the clinch work body locks. He isn't much of a striker, but should be faster here. He has an okay check hook and straight right. He has power. I've seen him knock guys out early. And when he gets on top, he's very effective. He's aggressive. He moves to dominant positions. If he can get to the back mount, the fight's likely going to be a wrap. And great top pressure, super squeeze when he gets uh, in a choking position. Take down defense is on point, and I expect him to uh, stuff the takedowns of Ruhil, who's going to be looking to take him down here. And for his opponent, Vikas Ruhil, he's still looking to prove himself. He debuted PFL last year, got finished quickly. It was his first fight in three years. So I don't know how PFL found him or how he got the opportunity in the first place. But 12-7, and seven, he trains out of India, which has not really produced very many good fighters. And this is a chance for him to get a big upset, though, in my opinion. He's not a striker. His defense isn't good, but... He does have power in his rear hand and tries to push the pace, faint, level change, and then throw punches. But Raw isn't a hard trick to read. He actually was having success landing in his most recent fight, but ended up start brawling and got dropped. And Chin seems very suspect to me. Um, but he's a big featherweight. He's a wrestler. Um, once he fires up against the cage, then go double leg. He's a decent single. On top of Raw, we'll throw ground and power and use that to force a submission, but... Most of his finishes are rear naked chokes. Isn't a powerful guy. Um, landed a lot of ground and pound in fights I watched and couldn't get opponents out of there. Looked uncomfortable when he was on his back his last fight. He got finished pretty quickly once he got there. Um, and I expect Nathan Kelly to get this fight done within the first round. I think he's probably going to take him down and get that submission with the rear naked choke here. And this next fight, we got Syrian Clark. He's taking on Darius Mafi. And Clark is another SPG guy. He's undefeated at 8-0, and all eight of those fights have been with Bellator. So he's getting close to probably taking that step up and ending up fighting better competition. But once again, kind of finding an unknown guy here. And Clark is moving down in weight here, which I'm a little bit surprised by because he has missed weight twice for 145. But came in, weighed in successfully at 139 his last fight for a 140-pound catch weight. And maybe that got him thinking that he should cut down and make that cut to bantam weight. So hopefully he could do it and he looks good on the scales. But he's a grinder. His striking has improved, but it still isn't good. Um, he looked better his last fight, I would say. He was more fluid. Um, footwork got better. But I think with this fight, he's going to look to wrestle. I mean, I, I just don't really see him looking to uh keep it on the feet for very long he really only throws a jab or big looping punches he's been hurt in fights but he recovers quick even his last fight he got dropped with an up kick so his chin isn't the greatest but you have to put him out you know he's not gonna quit and he has solid wrestling he has a good single leg he uses the single to get fighters to the fence and chain wrestle and when he gets on top he has good control good ground and pound good top pressure and usually tends to get guys tired and then finish them late um, he's a better grappler here, and I would imagine he's effective even off his back, where I can't say the same about Moffy. I've seen Moffy get back to the cage and taken down, so I'm sure Clark's going to get confidence out of seeing that. And Moffy is uh, low to the ground, and if he can control the center, it could be a harder fight than the odds indicate um, if he just can't get under him. But 
I think that uh, Clark obviously is going to be a big favorite for a reason. Moffey making his debut for Bellator on Friday. He's a super suspect record on paper. 4-1, and one, but his wins have came against some of the worst opponents he could find. He uh, finished his wins really quickly in the first round and really hasn't faced adversity or gained much experience. To me, the one time that he's taken the step up, he lost in the first round. He got finished by Ali Taleb at PFL 9 in a minute and 50 seconds. So now he's looking to take that O from an undefeated prospect and make a name for himself here, but it's going to be a difficult task. But Mafia's a big bantamweight. He has a wrestling-heavy style, comes forward with those big punches and then shoots the takedown, looks big and strong for the weight, and he throws some heavy punches. But um, I would say his footwork is all right. He has good jabs. Um good feints and then he comes in with the big overhand or the check hook but it doesn't move his head he's hittable um he's easy to leg kick because he has a low wide stance but he's gonna be the faster guy here and the more powerful guy here he probably has the better striking um but usually he wants to back guys up and wrestle and obviously i, I don't think that's gonna be effective game plan here i think that um if he tries to grapple with Clark, he's going to get submitted. So I don't trust Clark enough to be playing him at minus 1,000, but he's going to probably win here. He's used to fighting stronger opponents up at 145, so I don't think Moffy's size is going to be much of a factor. I wasn't blown away from the striking that Moffy showed, and I guess you could say he's a live knockout threat, but Clark likely wrestles to a win. He could finish in the later rounds. Um... And I'm going to say he gets a second round submission. I mean, Clark hasn't been fighting the highest level guys, but at least they weren't 2-45. and 45. Um, So I just have more faith picking Clark here. And this next fight, pretty good fight here with Alfie Davis taking on Tof Tofik Masayev. And Tofik Masayev, 34 years old, fighting out of Azerbaijan. And he started his career 4-3, and three, but since 2015, he's 18-2. and 1-1 one and one in Bellator. He has fought many times for Ryzen, and he won the Ryzen 21 night tournament, beat uh, Bellator champion Patricky Pitbull, he has other big wins as well. So even though he hasn't had a ton of Bellator fights, he still hasn't been fighting slouches. And his one Bellator loss was a little weird. I mean, uh, he got hit with a um, body kick that went down and hit the cup, and then he was trying to recover, and they ended up saying that the fight was over because it was a legal shot. So, took the TKO loss there, which who knows how the fight would have played out. But you look at how Musaya fights. He's a counter striker, knockout power. He's light on his feet. He likes to control the center. He'll walk fighters down and powerful kicks, those leg kicks, body kicks, and he could throw kicks with both legs. Sometimes you'll go uh, to the head with head kicks. He has nice question mark kicks, but... Most he throws to the legs and the body. His hands are very fast. He's a nice check hook, good rear hook, very accurate guy. He's gotten multiple one-punch knockouts, but can be low volume. And when he doesn't find the finish or when he's an opponent who isn't a forward fighter who goes for first, um, he can not do that much. And that's why I could see this match maybe being a boring fight. But if Musayev lands, though, he has the power to put your lights out. And he isn't a wrestler or a grappler, but he will catch kicks and take fighters down that way. And that could be something that could happen in this fight. Um, two submission wins, three submission losses. So normally he isn't finishing fights on the ground. Um, all but four of his 22 wins are knockouts. So usually when he gets the win, he's putting you to sleep. Um, finished a large majority of his fights in the first round, but has shown cardio to go all three. And his style allows him to control the pace. In this fight, I don't think he's going to have to deal with uh, takedowns. So it's going to be a good striking fight for him. And I don't think he's going to look to wrestle. Even though maybe he could catch a kick and score points by getting a takedown or two late in a round or something. I don't think it's going to be a big part of his game plan. Because Alfie Davis is dangerous off his back. And I don't think Musayev really trusts his grappling that much. But Alfie Davis, um, this is going to be his 10th Bellator fight on Friday. He's been a mainstay with the promotion for five years. And 7-1-1 one, one in his fight so far. And all of his wins have came against unranked fighters. He fought Alexander Shobley, who's ranked and lost a decision in that one. But 
He's fought no other ranked guys. So this is a big chance for him. He's fighting the number three guy in the Bellator rankings. And won two fights in a row over UFC veterans. He hasn't lost in almost three years. 32 years old. So in his prime. And if he can win this fight, he's going to jump right into title contention. But Alfie Davis, he's a point fighter. He likes to move around, use a ton of lateral movement and pull fighters into his strikes. He's fast. He's a dangerous kicking game. He likes to use the jab, the check hook, and crosses. And usually only throws single shots, but he'll throw a lot of side kicks with the lead leg. He'll switch stance, throw a body kicks, head kicks. Um, and he has all the kicks in his arsenal, you know, spinning kicks, axe kicks, jump kicks. He'll get creative. He does carry his hands low, but he's very difficult to hit. Um, easier to leg kick and get to the body than hit to the head. And he could take big shots too. He showed that against Alexander Shabley. He has a good chin. Never been finished before. Um, since he's always moving, unless he lands something crazy like a spin click, spin kick, or a clean head kick, he isn't going to be landing with significant power. But he has the card to implement his footwork and stick and move for three rounds. And he isn't much of an offensive wrestler or grappler. He hasn't had very many opponents able to crowd him and take him down. Um, when he has him put on his back, he's shown a pretty good defensive guard. And I think he'll be able to nullify anything from Tafik, Tafik from what I've seen if Tafik gets on top of him and maybe even threaten submissions. But Davis will try to mix in some double legs. I really kind of doubt he's going to try to take Musayev down, though. I think it's too dangerous. His last fight, he did show some control in the clinch, gets a long cruise. Um... But if anyone hits takedowns here, I think it's going to be Musayev. But more than likely, it's going to be a stand-up fight. Musayev has faced a similar fighter to Alfie Davis and Darren Cookshank and took that fairly easily. I think Davis may be a bit more in his prime than Cookshank was, but I expect the fight to go similar. I think Davis is going to move a lot, make the action really dull. But the times Tafik backs up Davis and uses his hands, he will land clean. And I think he'll land the heavier punches. He may hurt Davis a couple times or just be the guy going forward throwing more and I think he'll land his fair share of leg kicks and kicks in general too to match Davis in the kicking department and I think the over is probably going to be a good bet here as well I would be surprised if there's a finish um Masai has a lot of knockouts but Davis has never been knocked out and he has the style to evade and not get knocked out so Musai via decision is my prediction here and up next year we got James Gallagher taking on Leandro Higo and James Gallagher is a fighter who had a ton of hype at one point but injuries really stalled his career before James Gallagher fought Ricky Bandeas he was getting some of the biggest hype of any Bellator fighter I've seen if you were watching back then we all kind of remember um you know karma kind of got to him he was big he was talking a lot and then he got put to sleep with the sweet chain music you know a crazy kick by uh Ricky Bandeas but since then Gallagher has gotten some wins um, five and one since that loss, twelve and two overall. And his one loss that he's had during the stretch came against Patchy Mix, who's the current champ. And he just hasn't gotten it fully back though. Because he's had eight canceled fights during this period as well. Has not fought that often. He fought for the first time in almost two years in twenty twenty three. So hopefully he could jumpstart his career again and start to fight and uh, be active. But He's going to be looking to settle unfinished business here with the guy that has been talking shit back and forth to them for years. I mean, I remember the Pitbull brothers have been accusing James Gallagher of ducking a fight with Leandro Higo like five years ago. So um, the last time these guys were booked, Gallagher had to pull out. And this time, I believe um, Gallagher and Kennedy were supposed to fight at 135 maybe. Or I'm not 100% sure on that, but I know he was originally going to fight jeremy kennedy and then um kennedy got bumped up now he's gonna be fighting for the title in the co-main and Higo came in here on short notice so even though both these guys are normally 135ers they're gonna be fighting at 45 for this fight but james gallagher um we all kind of know his style um and if he can win this fight he's gonna be kind of back in a better position where he can kind of be closer to a title eliminator or a big time fight but um he's a high level grappler on the feet he doesn't really have power um doesn't have great defense so he tends to struggle um but he has a long bladed stance he blitzes in with the one twos decent overhand left you'll throw some kicks and his priority is just to back guys up so he can work his body locks and if 
you force Gallagher to strike long term, he will start to get hit. He will be uncomfortable. His cardio isn't the greatest either when he's forced to strike. But he's really only been hurt once badly, and that was that loss to Bandejas. No knockout wins. I will say Gallagher did go to Thailand for this camp, so there is a chance of improved striking for this fight. But Gallagher is a great grappler. He's awesome at hitting clinch takedowns. He's been able to take down practically every opponent he's ever fought. And on top, he has excellent top control. He's methodical, forces fighters into making a mistake, and then he capitalizes. He's really good from the back mount. He's finished a lot of fights with first-round Runica chokes. His guillotine is also a go-to submission for him. He isn't the best or very active when he's put on his back, and he will let fighters hold him down. We saw that happen in his lost patchy mix. He was going for the guillotines and put on his back and couldn't get back up. But in that fight, he actually did well. I mean, he won a round in that fight, if you ask me. And um, in the third round, though, he got caught in a guillotine and submitted. And Ego has a sick guillotine, so I would be very weary of protecting my neck and aware when I shoot if I'm James Gallagher. In that fight with Mix, it was a few. Um, it was one of the few fights where someone was shooting on Gallagher, and it seemed like Gallagher, like I said, seemed like he would rather attack Guillotine than defend the takedown. He got close on a couple, but he ended up getting tired, and he's used to fishing guys early, so he needs to get takedowns in cement top position when he can't get that early finish, and if he can't, he will get tired, but 3-0 and in decisions... And he's still young. He's 27 years old. So he still has a lot of chances to keep getting better. He just needs to get back in the cage and fight more. But his opponent, Leandro Higo, grizzled 36-year-old veteran. He's fought 28 times, 22-6 and six overall. He's training out of the Pitbull Fighters gym. And probably the most successful fighter outside of the Pitbull Brothers to come out of that gym. Captured the LFA title at 135 pounds in 2017. He's fought for it. The Bellator 135 pound title as well. And even at his age, he isn't really slowing down. He's won four of his last five fights. Picked up some big wins, such as over Nikita Mikhailov. He beat Darion Caldwell. He beat Ricky Bandejas. And this is a chance for Ego to get a win over a fighter with the fan base and make a case for a title shot. Like I said, the fight is at 145. Um, but Ego's had some issues making weight. So I'm sure he's going to welcome this for... Uh, this fight being at 145. Higo is 0-1 in his career at 145, though, and Gallagher has several wins at 145. So if you look at how they performed there, Gallagher has done better, but really low sample size, hard to say. But Higo, low-volume power striker, throws very heavy low kicks, power overhand. When he's fought wrestlers recently, it's really nullified his stand-up. He seems extremely hesitant to commit to anything. Uh, he's scared to get taken down. And he allows himself to get backed up and just relies on landing a big one-punch counter. But he isn't a crazy fast or a slick guy, so he finds it hard to land much outside of kicks. Doesn't offend leg kicks himself, and he is fairly hittable, but he's durable. And he's going to be the more powerful guy and definitely the more dangerous striker. Takedown offense is not great. He has a nasty guillotine, and that's a danger factor when wrestling him. But he's fallen too in love with that, and he always attacks guillotine instead of defending submission. If you get Higo on his back, he will struggle in this fight. He tends to give up his back. And I wouldn't be shocked if Gallagher hit the Runica choke in the first round. We saw Nikita Mikhailov got really close to hitting the Runica choke in round one of Higo's last fight. And even if Higo can defend the submissions, I think he will be held down if he gets taken down. Isn't a big submission threat off of his back. And he can't create some scrambles, but I think that Gallagher is going to be very heavy on top. Higo's cardio isn't an issue, and he should have an advantage there. But he isn't someone that really pushes the pace, so I think it's going to be hard to really capitalize on that. I think it's going to be a good fight for James Gallagher. The southpaw style takes away the leg kicks from Higo, and Gallagher should be a lot faster. As far as wrestling goes, Gallagher has an advantage, and Higo is too in love with the guillotine. Gallagher should be able to defend the guillotines and control on top. If Higo looks to get up aggressively, Gallagher will likely get the back and submit him. I don't see Higo catching him on the feet as very likely, so... I'm going to predict Gallagher wins this match via decision in pretty dominant fa fashion. I don't know that he does very much damage, but I think he has a lot of control. I think he gets the back. And Gallagher's ina inactivity is concerning to people, but he goes not been much more active. Since 2021, Gallagher's fought twice. He goes fought three times. Gallagher is significantly younger, and 35 years old is getting up there for the weight class. So I'm going to James Gallagher in this one to win via decision. And in this next fight... 
We got Tim Wilde. He's taking on Man Mano Souza. And Tim Wilde, he's been looking better than ever lately, and he's a winner of five in a row. The 36-year-old, 17-4-1, and, and has lost only one time in the past seven years. He's not only won, but he's won as the underdog the majority of the time. And if he can get by an undefeated, dangerous prospect, I expect Wilde to get a big-time fight next. And he's a high-level striker. He's tall, long, lanky, super fast, and crisp jab. He pressures forward, faints, works the jab, and straight right hand. Very fast, accurate guy. He has nice head kicks, also attacks the body, pushes the pace, throws it a high clip. I think his pressure will be effective in this fight unless he gets clipped. And he has tall man defense and leaves his chin out there. Um, this fight that is dangerous. He will also lean back to try to land counter crosses. And they can be effective because he's a tall guy. But he got dropped in the first round of his fight with Yves Landu, who's an explosive fighter. He's been knocked out twice. And Mano Souza is very explosive and powerful. So that is uh, a scary thing if you're leaning towards Wild. But Wild does have excellent cardio and he recovers quickly. And he's a great anti grappler, man. The guy sprawls on point, great balance, really good get ups. He's super hard to hold down. Dangerous submissions from full guard. He throws nice elbows. He got submitted in a couple of losses, but both came when he was on top. It seems like sometimes when he gets in top position, he could fall asleep and get caught. Um, he's been fighting a lot of wrestlers recently, and his wrestling defense is going to be on point for this fight. But Mano Souza, undefeated Brazilian fighter, 26 years old, and he's fighting for the first time since February of 2023. He had kind of a crazy year uh, last year. He had an opportunity to fight in the Contender Series, but since he was contracted by the PFL, they didn't allow it. And Souza then sued the PFL and tried to get out of his contract, but... It, I guess they figured it out. I mean, the PFL signed Souza, but they made him a backup fighter for the regular season. So I think he was upset that he wasn't going to be fighting for that year and they blocked him from a fight. Um, but like I said, I guess that has been resolved now. And he's coming back. He's fighting for Bellator. And his last fight was his first really hard fight. His first nine fights were all finishes. Most recent fight went to a split decision. Hopefully that was something to build on for Souza, and in the year off, he's improved and gotten better. Um, getting a step of competition here, he's taking on a very underrated fighter in Tim Wilde. And Manuel Souza, he's a fast, powerful, and explosive fighter, especially early on. Good at bouncing it out of range. He'll explode in with power punches. Nasty straight and overhand right. Good power lead hook. And if he connects clean in the first round when he's fresh, he's probably going to put out Tim Wilde. Um, he will go to the body to open up headshots. He's good at brawling too because he's powerful and he's fearless. And unless he just catches Wild clean early on in this fight, though, I think he's going to probably struggle with the jab of Wild. Um, he isn't, like, that technical of a striker. Like, you'll see him throwing punches from too far out of range and um, kind of chasing. And I think uh, as he gets tired, it, it just gets worse. And Wild will be able to take advantage of that because he could fight off the back foot. But Mano Souza, he's an aggressive submission grappler. Pressures guys, and then you will shoot in and try to hit that double. On top, he's looking for subs, but he he loses position sometimes. Um, went hard for the submission finish in the first round of his last fight. It got him tired. Um, and he still showed great grappling overall. He was able to reverse several positions and be on top for the most of the fight. I don't, I don't agree with that being a split decision. I thought he clearly won. Um, and his cardio actually looked decent, which I was surprised to see. But this is another fight Tim Wilde can win to me. I mean, he's a better technical striker. He's the height, region, height reach, and speed edge. Souza has good wrestling and submissions, but I don't see his wrestling being effective versus Wilde. Wilde has fought better wrestlers than Souza and defended their takedowns. Unless he gets caught and knocked out here, I see him uh, winning either via late knockout or decision. So Tim Wilde just needs to be the fighter moving forward. He can't get backed up near the cage. And I think if he gets out of the first round, he's going to have a good chance to win. So give me Tim Wilde to get the victory in this one. And next fight here, we got Fabian Edwards. He's going to be taking on Aaron Jeffrey. And Fabian Edwards is a high-level kickboxer. He's rounded out his wrestling over the years. Obviously the brother of Leon Edwards. So he has great genes. He's an awesome athlete. And he's been in Bellator basically his whole career. We've seen him grow into the fighter he is. His last fight was for the middleweight title versus Johnny Eblen. And he was winning the fight on the scorecards, but 
got knocked out in the third round. Now he's looking to stake his claim that a rematch is needed, and that starts with taking out Aaron Jeffrey. Fabian Edwards is a long kickboxer, good at controlling the center of the octagon, and his reach makes it where he can tag fighters as they try to close the distance. Uh, he can hit them before they can touch him. And he's a long bladed stance. He's always cocked and ready to throw that rear cross. Pool counters are dangerous. He's a nice check hook. He'll flurry with some nice combos when he can back guys up. Good kicks to all parts of the body. But questionable durability. He got knocked out in his last fight. He's been hurt in other fights. And he doesn't want to get hit clean against Jeffrey or brawl with him because Jeffrey is the more durable guy. But Edwards has only been knocked out once. So hopefully he doesn't get that last knockout loss from his fight with uh, Eblen in his head and he can recover from that. But Edwards is a good anti-grappler. He's improved his wrestling offense and defense. Clinch game is nasty. He's hard to control there. He has really good elbows. His wrestling offense has become more part of his game recently and good body lock game. On top, he has decent top control. Takedown defense has gotten a lot better and he's a lot harder to hold down as well. So I think that it's probably going to be a standout fight in this one. And Aaron Jeffrey is a roughneck veteran who's tough to beat. He hasn't been in Bellator very long, but he's made a big impact. He jumped into the deep end right away, picked up some big wins. He knocked out Austin Vanderford. His last fight, he took out um, Don, Don Rossa and took the O from him. He was an undefeated American top team prospect. And he's established himself as one of the best Bellator middleweights. This fight's likely going to be um, one that urges him a title shot if he wins, I believe. But Jeffrey's a big fighter for the weight class. Comes to fight, he's well conditioned, he's ready to push the pace. He walks guys down, he's a good high guard. Tries to block the shots and land jabs, big power hooks, and push fighters against the fence. Good leg kicks, good front kicks to the body. Decent punching power, but the majority of his finishes come through knees in the clinch. And he's good at getting dirty, breaking fighters down on the inside. And this can be a different matchup for Jeffrey than he's normally had because most of the fighters who Jeffrey has gone against are forward pressure guys and guys that are trying to take him down. In this fight, he's facing a long kickboxer, so it's a different look. And Jeffrey's good at beating wrestlers. He's hard to take down, especially against the cage. He makes fighters pay for the takedowns. He'll sprawl he <coughs> excuse me, heavily on them throw knee short punches, wear them out. He's been able to take out some very good wrestlers and grapplers through his career. And he can't be taken down, but the way you take him down is through mixing it up. You can't just blind shoot on him. John Salter was able to get the back and ride out Jeffrey in their fight, get the win with some takedowns. But Aaron Jeffrey's a hard fighter to beat, and I think it'll be even harder to beat over five rounds. But I like Fabian Edwards in this fight. I think he's longer, faster, cleaner. Um, he can land counter strikes and maintain the center. And I think in the clinch, he's going to be the more violent guy and be more effective there. And that takes a, a big part of Jeffrey's game away. Um, Edward's chin is a little worrying and Jeffrey is durable and going to be winging power punches. So as long as Edward doesn't get chinned, I expect him to win minutes and win the decision. I don't think a finish is that likely for Edwards, but if Jeffrey wins, I see it more than likely being a knockout. But I'm going to pick Fabian Edwards to win via decision. And in the co-main event here, we have Patricio Pitbull. He's taking on Jeremy Kennedy. And Jeremy Kennedy is getting a pretty lucky break here. I mean, the guy originally, like I first said at the top of um, when I was speaking on another breakdown, he was going to be fighting James Gallagher on this card. But now he's you know, getting a title fight. Before, he had no title on the line, and um, Pitbull actually wasn't really going to be ready for this spot either, so all the things kind of aligned for Kennedy, because Pitbull had a fight as well in February that fell through, and that's why he was able to fight on this date, and for Pitbull, this is a big fight for him, because he's 36 years old, he's lost two fights in a row, and this is for his belt, so this kind of is his relevance at the moment. You know, obviously he's not on a good run. And if he loses his title as three losses in a row, I mean, that kind of is definitely going to show the downfall of Patricio Pitbull. So even though Jeremy Kennedy is getting a big moment to challenge the champion, he's going to be getting a motivated guy in Patricio Pitbull. And I feel like Pitbull is the more dangerous striker in this matchup. 
his patience should do him good in this fight because he's going to force Kenny to come to him. Counter puncher, he throws some nasty calf kicks and then looks to pull counter with the rear cross. He's low volume, but he's patient, accurate. He hits hard. He's very fast. And I think that he'll be able to pick apart uh, Kennedy if they stay at distance. And he has good wrestling and great grappling. His wrestling defense has gotten a lot better training with the Fight Ready camp. Uh, we saw him really shut down guys like Juan Archuleta, who are high-level wrestlers. And he's really strong. He's fought bigger fighters, so he's hard to control in the clinch. He'll turn it around and hold fires up against the fence. And he has a nasty guillotine, which I think he's a chance to land here. And if he actually does end up on his back, um, I don't think he's going to get finished, but I think he could get held down. So he needs to stay away from that. Um, cardio has been a problem in high-paced fights for Pitbull. So if you're Kennedy, you're going to want to look to push the pace. But Jeremy Kennedy is a strong wrestler. He uses a wide stance, and he's heavy on his lead leg, so he can shoot in hard. And that also gives him the ability to jab well and lean back to evade shots. But it also is giving him problems with leg kicks. We saw in his fight with Adam Borix, that leg got destroyed. And Pitbull has nasty low kicks. So I think that stance is going to give Kennedy some issues. But Kenny's jab is okay. He can feint the level change that come over the top of the big right hand. He doesn't have very much power and isn't a big threat standing. But he shines in the grappling realm. He isn't someone who's an explosive freestyle wrestler. But he's really strong in the clinch against the cage. He's good at finding trips and getting in on the legs. He's good at getting to the back. He has no issues just riding guys, mat returning them, getting them tired. And when he can get into the back mount or into dominant positions, he's good at maintaining those positions. His cardio is on point. And if he wins this fight, it's probably going to be a five-round grind fest. Um, he has gone five-round one time a long time ago. But this is his first kind of major title and big fight like this. Pitbull, to me, he didn't take his last fight serious, and he paid the price. He fought super quick after a five-round war. Um, he fought up in weight, and I think he thought he could get an easy win, get the bad taste out of his mouth, but he, he was made to pay for it. And I think he's taking the appropriate amount of time off, and that should have lit a fire under him. This is a good match bomb paper here. I think he could play out similar to how Pitbull's fight with Warren Archuleta did, but I think Pitbull can use his patience to not give Kennedy cl easy clinch entries, Chip away with low kicks, counters. And I don't think Kennedy is just going to grind on Pitbull for five rounds. I actually see Pitbull hurting Kennedy and then hitting a guillotine when Kennedy gets more desperate. So give me Pitbull to win this fight via third round submission here. And finally, we got the main events. We got Corey Anderson taking on Carl Moore. And Corey Anderson is a fighter who's been one of the best light heavyweights in the world since he won the Ultimate Fighter in 2014. Had a long and good career in the UFC, but never got a chance to fight for the title and came over to Bellator. He's had two cracks of the Bellator light heavyweight title. The first time he likely was going to win the belt. I mean, he was dominating, but an accidental clash heads turned into a no contest. And when they ran the fight back, Anderson clearly lost via decision. He did bounce back and beat Phil Davis at Bellator 297. And now he's looking to turn back a newer generation fighter. And although Anderson has all that experience, he still never touched gold. So he has that motivation and he's 34 years old, so he's not that old. As long as as his durability holds up, he's going to have years left in him. And I believe this fight's for a vacant belt. So Corey Anderson is going to have a chance to win a title here. And his style is pretty basic. He has great pressure, cardio, and wrestling. He has improved his head movement. He locks the walk fighters down, slip and rip with the left hook of their right hand. Shoot in, get the takedown, and... Um, can wrestle you for 15 minutes. He'll double jab his way into takedown sometimes. Super fast level change. is really good single leg. And I think in this fight where he's a southpaw, that single is going to be really available. And on top of a solid ground and pound, he can um, sometimes get hit as he enters range. And obviously his chin has cost him in some high profile spots where he's gotten knocked out. Um, he could throw kicks. Sometimes in punching range with his hands down, and we've seen that cost him. So he just needs to be a little bit smarter. I wouldn't throw any kicks in this fight, honestly. And um, just pressure hard, wrestle for the entire fight. Um, use his ability to mix it up. I think that's going to be the main key in this fight. But Carl Moore, he's getting the biggest fight of his career on Friday. He's fighting a perennial top 10 light heavyweight. And not only is he main eventing a Bellator versus the biggest name he's ever fought, but he's also doing it in his hometown of Belfast, Ireland. And 
Moore signed in Bellator in 2019, won his debut, but he had to battle injuries. He didn't fight again after that until 2022. Picked up some big wins, though. I mean, he was able to get the biggest wins of his career and put himself into this position. Style-wise, Carl Moore is well-rounded. Good offense on the feet. He's southpaw, fairly mobile. He has fast hands, fast kicks. He throws hard left kicks to all parts of the body. Rear left cross and right hook are accurate. Good jab. Um, his speed isn't bad, but sometimes he can get lazy, throw some slow, sloppy punches. I think he's susceptible to counters when he does that. And he's been fished with strikes before one time. Um, almost got knocked out recently against Carl Brexton as well. And he's a pretty good grappler. Takedown defense is good. He's gotten better at getting his back up, uh, getting his back off the cage when he's pushed there. In previous fights, he's had issues being held against the fence, but against Carl, it looked better. And he actually could take guys down as well. Um, good back takes. He has five submission wins. Um, but I think Corey Anderson will get the knockout win here. It's not an easy matchup because Moore can wrestle as power and could maybe catch him or something. But I think Moore struggles when fire to blend things well. And Anderson's excellent at that. You see Moore defend takedowns, but then you'll get hit clean off the breaks. I've seen fighters shoot, uh, shoot more stuff to shot, and then them come up with a punch and uh, rock more. And I think Anderson could fake shots, come up with punches, um, and find the knockout. And I think he could just mix it up and really get more out of um, kind of guessing what he's going to do and eventually put him to sleep or TKO him. So give me Corey Anderson here, and I'm going to say he wins via second round KO TKO. So there you have it, guys. It's a full card breakdown of predictions for Bellator champion series belfast hopefully you enjoyed the video please hit the like button please subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed gonna be doing a ufc card breakdown later on in the week so be on the lookout for that and really appreciate you guys go to patreon.com right now to get patreon.com slash guru right now to get access to the bets that i do have already placed and more content going on later on in this week really appreciate everyone that's over there support now and would love more of you guys to come over and join them and besides that, man, I'll talk to you guys soon.